Listen to people, learn what you can. Mm-hmm. What is racist and what is just ignorance? If you've got a friend or an ally or somebody in your corner there to support you, amazing. I just can't wait for the day where like, we're no longer pleasantly surprised that someone is like LGBT plus. Ask questions on a personal level, do better. Asking pronouns. It was like the moment that I realized I was different. Winning that award topped this year off for me. Because without you, this world wouldn't be the same. Are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? Disclaimer, all views shared by young people are their own. They do not represent the views of Oxfordshire youth. Trigger warning, so throughout this episode we will be talking about disability and within this we would touch on anxiety, depression, abuse, suicide and if this is triggering for you in any way, please feel free to pause this episode and listen to another one. Hi there, it's Darius. I'm the youth-led content creator here at Oxfordshire Youth. We are on episode two of season four of Are You Listening? the Oxford Youth Podcast. We are so happy that you could join us. Make sure you subscribe. Share with your friends, your family, your colleagues and your teams. Share on social media and amplify the voices of young people to make sure that many more people are actually listening. We want these Health Watch episodes to reach every professional working with children and young people, whether that's in Oxfordshire or beyond. Let's get into this episode. Hi, and welcome back to Are You Listening? from Oxfordshire Youth. Uh, My name is Molly, my pronouns are she, her, and today we're kicking off season four with our little mini series. Uh, We're kind enough to be sponsored by Healthwatch, who are the independent health and social care watchdog for Oxford. They would like to hear our opinions and experiences, and we are more than happy to give them. Uh, They are sort of in charge of, I guess, liaising with Um, different health and social care services around the county and making sure our voices are heard and we were also very very kindly being hosted in this nice space by St Edward's School we're using their nice facilities to record this episode and yeah today we're talking about um, invisible and visible disabilities with my dear friends Hamza and Issa. So we're talking today about invisible and visible disabilities and yeah, we've got quite a like a, a range of ideas, sort of things to to get through. So yeah, what what are your thoughts? Where would you like to begin? I think we should definitely first of all talk about education, as mm. I think that education and disability aren't two topics that are usually talked about in tandem, mm. and they they need to be because quite a lot of um problems with the societal perception of people with disabilities I think often are perfectly kind of showcased within the education system. I've definitely found that that as well. I feel like uh, a lot of sort of both disabilities and how people perceive disabilities can start sort of in childhood and you know you tend to spend time in school in childhood and so if for whatever reason illness or something like that you don't spend a lot of time in school then that can affect not only your life but also sort of how your peers see you yeah Issa what do you think well no I agree with both of you because I mean me I have epilepsy so it's like it's been with me since I was born and um, it's like it just happens when either I go to sleep or I have a shower and it just triggers then but it's I mean it hasn't ruined my life but I take it as an advantage because I can actually do things compared to other people and it's just about confidence and opening up and I've managed to do that so I'm yeah I'm glad I did it. I think a lot of um, people in education, well, definitely in my case, um, in secondary schools, I feel like most of the discrimination part part of it um, mainly 
implicit uh, discrimination or, as it's more widely known, implicit bias towards the disabled. So not overt discrimination, but more subtle or maybe just ignorant discrimination starts in secondary schools because in primary school I had I had no problems with anybody and nobody had mm-hmm. any problems with me and they didn't treat me any differently but yeah as soon as I got into secondary school people were like were like how does this person fit into a clique yeah. they don't mm-hmm. really and I Going into secondary school, I was always like, it can't be as bad as the movies, can it? And then when I actually went there, I was like, it's worse than yeah. the movies. Yeah. You're like, oh, I'm just in this this environment and I don't have the same snappy comebacks that all the kids in like films had. <laughs> but everyone's yeah. just as mean. Whenever someone disrespected me or insulted me or did something that I saw as disrespect, I would just cry at everything, which is the worst possible response that you can have in secondary school because everyone just labels you a attention seeker and everyone labels you kind of a tattletale and like for example i've had situations where um when i'm upset girls have stroking my hair like i'm a horse or a <laughs> dog or something yeah i've had situations where at prom for for example this is the perfect example uh, none of the people actually in my year, the people who I spent five years with, actually came to dance for me. It was all their older and o- older brothers and sisters mm-hmm. from college who I barely knew, who were hanging out with me all night. And then after that night happened, those people never spoke to me again. Yeah. And, um, but I think that's just secondary school in general. But I think the biggest thing when it comes to disabilities is that they just they do, they don't know how to understand themselves like just teenagers in general yeah uh, your teenage years are just like trying to figure out who you are in a lot of ways and i'm 20 and i'm still trying to figure out who i am and in a lot of ways if you add a disability into that equation everything is a lot more layered, layered, and I think it's a bit too many layers for yeah. for for quote unquote able able bodied or like non disabled. I hate saying that word, mm. but non disabled kids to kind of deal with an an approach like they don't want to offend, they don't want to like assume, so they just go with the default option like oh, from what I've seen in media people can be um people with disabilities can act more infant like yeah or, or yeah. stuff like that and stuff and they don't actually ask questions ask questions please <laughs> ask questions we want to be mm. asked questions and so we can like get rid of the myths that are kind of spread around about us sorry i'll let you speak <laughs> no no you're right yeah i feel like with with teenagers and especially just like younger kids then they can sort of like learn and they can change and I mean adults can as well but like a lot of things hurt 10 times more coming from adults like a child like maybe they've you know never seen someone with this condition before and maybe they've seen some of the god-awful representation that there can be out there and but it's it's when like an adult or a teacher just doesn't doesn't get it (laughs) Like, I've got a as yet undiagnosed muscle um, condition. It's causing my nerves to, like, deteriorate. And I started showing signs of it when I was, like, in primary school. And, but nobody knew at the time. So I was just seen as, like, the chubby kid that didn't want to do PE. <laughs> and so all of the teachers would sort of, like, push me and push me and push me until I couldn't physically do it anymore. And so that that was what, like, got to me the most that, like, adults could misunderstand in such a massive way because like kids you don't you don't expect them to sort of know everything and you can teach them what what they need to know but it's it's the adults 
Isa, have you had any <laughs> experiences yeah, how was in I have. Oh, secondary school was a nightmare with my condition because it's like they actually were ignorant towards it. Even like me telling them so many times about mm. it, they'll just be like, okay, we've done about you. We've yeah. had enough of you and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, but I'm a person with this condition. You're supposed to be supporting me. But comparing it to primary school, I was given more support in primary compared to secondary but it should be the other way around as well. But mm. um, it's like in primary when we used to go swimming, I used to have support from my teachers in case I have I had a seizure or something. And like in secondary school, I wasn't given that. And that's what kind of put me down because I was like demotivated and teachers wouldn't support me. But then it came to a part where I had to stand up for myself and start speaking about it and it got better. That's a big thing, like standing up for yourself yeah. because they're, I had like such a problem like saying no or saying no I really can't do this yeah. so I'd say I have like an I just had an operation I can't do xyz yeah. mm-hmm. and then they'd say oh but could you do it a little bit and I'd go I can yeah. try but you, you gotta learn to say no yeah. not doing it yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah see I tried that approach in my secondary school and it completely backfired because I literally took up an entire PSHC lesson because my tutor allowed me to make a presentation on my disability mm. and she present it to the rest of my form and they still they still didn't get it and um and like one of the worst things that happened to me was um like I was hearing from my school bully that one of my friends who was also his best friend, so we were like mutual friends. Uh, yeah. Um, was like, oh, by the way, he doesn't really like you. He just hangs out with you, like out of pity and stuff. Mm. And I and and um, I was like, I was like, no, you're wrong. And then um, and then like, I confronted him, and then I overheard him agreeing with my bully that like. I think it was like him saying I'm I'm a bit weird or something but like but like that's all I needed to hear and then I confronted him about it and I and I and this was like my biggest like like anger induced moment that I had in school I was like you will never know what it's like to be me mm. never like but you still assume to know stuff about me but you don't even ask you don't even get to know me you don't even try and and like as he was trying to calm me down and get us to be friends again as the school bell rang he walked away with my bully and said said this is stupid don't know why he's getting upset and I was yeah like, oh the you don't know why you're getting upset yeah sort of thing that's oh it's it's the way that they sort of expect you to like translate yourself for them <laughs> so that i mean yeah there's there's a lot to be to be said about speaking to disabled people and asking questions but equally like do we owe you an answer <laughs> google is free but yeah i mean i'd rather them ask questions than just assume they yeah, know everything yeah. <laughs> the biggest amount of discrimination uh, that I witnessed in school was from the teachers. Big surprise. Um, they basically, when it came time to fit my GCSE, uh, GCSEs in year nine, I was like, okay, I definitely want to know what I want to do. I want to do, I want to do um, music, drama, and history. Those are like the three ones that I really want to do. And they were like, okay, we'll let you do music. But history might be too hard for you. And I was like, okay. And then and then I was like, I want to do drama. And then they were like, okay. And then like I had a meeting with my drama teacher at the time. And she was like, yeah, can you do like the costume designing course? Or like yeah. the, 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 the lighting course or the tech course? Like, and I'm like, I want to be an actor. That's what I want to do. I want to act and just for the sake of appeasing them I said okay I'll try it out at least and 
what came as a shock to me was on the first drama lesson of term, I um I found out that I was the only one doing the tech mm. course or or like costume designing course. And for the first lesson I had to I had to watch as all of the other students in the same room were doing acting on the other side of the room and then I was forced to write about Victorian dresses on the other side oh of the room gosh. on my laptop. Yeah. And then uh, and then I I literally complained to the head of my department and I was like and I was like, I wanna do acting. I don't and I remember this vividly what I said next. I don't care if I fail the course, let me do it just let me try let me do it and and they said okay what they took that to mean was we'll let him do the acting lessons but we won't grade him for any of his coursework or any of the work over the three uh, years yeah. and they didn't tell me and then when i checked my report card at the end of year 11 there wasn't even a you to say that i failed there was just blank just space blank. Oh next God. to drama and that mentally destroyed me for year for years i was just like what's the point in me even being here anymore if nothing i do matters to to anyone who can who can actually help me get where i want to be because nobody who can actually help me get me where i want to be like cares about people like me gcses man (laughs) they bring out the worst in teachers there's i was i missed like two three years of school because I was just too ill to attend and I I mean they tried they let me into like the learning support area for an hour every day so I could sit by myself and do work and they were sort of it was like they were kind of gently saying listen you're gonna fail and we're not we're not gonna sort of I guess waste our time trying to teach you it's it's evident that you're not gonna make it um and I literally had to teach myself and still got all eights at GCSE. <laughs> Damn. Thank you for the silent applause. <laughs> but yeah, just give us an opportunity to try and we yeah. will do it. Yeah. I yeah. may have had a meltdown through every single mock I ever sat, but when it came to the real exam, I still did it. Like I got on my dream college course last year doing acting level two for, for for the first time at age 19, meanwhile everyone else in my class was like 16 going on 17, like, and, and that's where I wanted to be at 16, because I knew I could pass level 2 with flying colours, I understood all the coursework, I, I even got like, when, when they were actually grading the individual exams when I was in GCC, they gave me like distinctions and stuff. So they knew that I could you realistically could pass the stuff. And so last year I finally got my level two uh, distinction in drama. And um, they gave me free passage to level three, even though I didn't pass maths yet. I don't really pass English, but English was all I needed, thank God. I, I wasn't going to go back to college this year if I didn't pass English last year. Thankfully, I did. Um, but then I had to leave. But I can get into that another time. Um, but yeah, um, education really doesn't understand um, people like us, do they? Yeah, I guess my main sort of message to teachers and to those in education would be to let us try it for ourselves but believe us when we ask for help (laughs) yeah yeah that's good yeah Yeah. how was your your gcse experience oh don't even get me started i don't mean to bring up any like trauma (laughs) but (laughs) literally um bonding yeah this is trauma (laughs) bonding um gcse english i was meant to have extra time and when it came to the exam i didn't get it and i ended up like getting a three and when it came to um, uh, what do you call it, results day, I opened it up and I failed it. And then I was like to them, it was because I didn't get my extra time. And then they were like, oh, you can do it again, but um, you'd have to go to college and then come back to us. I was thinking to my head, but you didn't pa- let me pass this or have extra time, so why should I come back? Yeah. So I just continued yeah. in the college and I made it better there. I got a three in English last last year and like not last year but the year before that 
And I was like, come on. Does this mean I can't get on to level two? Thankfully, my drama tutor at college, she's an angel. She pulled me out of a lesson I was in one day because she heard that I liked to do drama. And so every week during my first year, I would... um, I would go in on Wednesday, the day I wasn't supposed to go in, to spend three hours uh, doing acting. Not on the course, not being graded or anything, just because I wanted to do it and because it was fun. And she pulled me out of the last drama lesson of that year and she was like, I want you on the course next year. Like, I don't care if you don't pass pass or English, you you can do it in this department alongside your studies like that's fine just yeah so like i wish teachers <laughs> had that level of um a lot of them don't care um um uh, i wish more teachers had that level of understanding and like flexibility flexibility yeah. is that word when it comes to disability you need flexibility you need to learn how to be flexible on your views. You need to learn how to be flexible with your perspective, like everything. And yeah, enough about education because we're getting really angry at this point. <laughs> yeah, um, <but laughs> yeah I, we probably need to stop being mean to teachers. But um, yeah, but, yeah some I of get... you are awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah there are good teachers. <laughs> I wish I could find them. <laughs> 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 but yeah, what you were saying, um, disabled people, we are sort of have to be by nature resourceful and flexible. And like, this is a music stand, not a table. <laughs> but to us, it's a table. <laughs> and I think if they just sort of understood that if they give us a chance, we will take it and we will run with it. And I just, yeah, I just need them to know that we are trying (laughs) and that we are working as hard as we can but you got to give us something (laughs) yeah so we were talking about during the planning meetings as well you brought up a really good point about like different um ethnic communities and how sort of they consider disability and sort of different views like in asian households you have parents who support the child who has a disability but on the other hand you have parents who actually can't handle them but I mean fortunately I have parents who actually care about me and who are considerate and who have been there all the all the stuff away and they've like supported me whenever and wherever but I'm just thinking about those who don't have who parents don't actually give them the opportunity and don't even support them and I actually feel sorry for them because they're capable of doing things but then when they don't have the support from their parents or any household member, then it's quite tough on them. Yeah, absolutely. The amount that we sort of have to stick up for ourselves, it can be so tiring and you really need sort of someone in your corner. Yeah. Molly, I'm just cu- I'm just curious. Um, has there been any like instances where you have also experienced uh, discrimination like outside of school settings or like anywhere other than school yeah I feel like um yeah what you guys were saying was really important there's sort of like a lot of layers to being disabled so you're a teenager you're a disabled teenager you're part of a variety of other communities and I feel like there's a there's a very unique sort of treatment that uh, a lot of disabled women get and doctors man (laughs) so they a lot of the time it's sort of seen as the whole I don't know if you're familiar with like the hysteria thing from like the I guess the 1950s or sometime like that where women would be just given the sort of broad label of hysterical for a variety of complaints from like mental health difficulties to physical disabilities and to some extent, I feel like that's still going on. We're sort of given these these broad labels and diagnoses so that people 
don't have to bother to listen to us or don't have to bother to investigate and figure out what's wrong. I was told for the, the longest time that what was wrong with me was anxiety, it was social anxiety. And then they looked a, bit, a little bit deeper and they went, oh no, you're also autistic. And then they looked a little bit deeper and they went, oh yeah, there is physical things going on as well. Mm. Yeah, doctors can, well, it's an, I feel like not just in the disabled community, but as a whole, uh, they can sometimes dis- uh, misdiagnose or kind of like assess a uh, diagnosis or a problem uh, in the wrong manner but I think it especially in the disabled community like uh, we get kind of um, people don't really how do I say this nicely because there are there are, I've had so many good doctors oh there yeah are, yeah there, there are so many good doctors um many of mine have been really good I've come to find out that like especially when you're like going to see the doctor about mental uh mm. stuff it's a lot more difficult for them to like kind of know what to do with you in a se- in yeah. a sense uh like, for example, um, I approached the doctor one time about wanting counselling and they were like, uh, have you tried this? And then they, like, sent me, like, a number to call for, like, Talking Space Plus, which which is really helpful uh, to other people, I've heard. But when I tried it, it didn't help very much. Because, one, this was during the pandemic, where everything was a phone call. Yeah. So I I didn't have that tangible, like, connection with someone to kind of grasp onto and kind of really get to the root of my problems, I guess. Mm. Um, And to this day, I haven't tried counseling again mainly mainly because it's a bit weird because i'm such an advocate for disability but like i have such a fear of like being labeled more dis more disabled if that like sense of like oh he's he's got cerebral palsy and he's got anxiety and he's got depression it's like oh you're triple disabled I, I have really bad anxiety and claustrophobia and depression and I and I think I might be agoraphobic as well because mm. um, I hate crowds um, and stuff which is ironic because of what I do but <laughs> um, yeah like but once again disclaimer to everyone watching there are some great doctors out there doctors that that do go above and beyond mm. um, for you and the treatment that you need. We support our NHS. Yes, mm. and nurses as well. I've had the, just the loveliest nurses. Yes. I have such good luck with nurses. My, <laughs> my mum is currently a nursing assistant at Sobal, Sobal House and the crew there are just amazing. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for chatting to me. It's been been great hearing your your thoughts your experiences and yeah thank you so much for for being being here <laughs> thank you thank you thanks if anything said in this podcast has affected you in any way please feel free to contact the yellow sunbrain scope or cams to reassure you what an amazing episode that was in this episode the young people chatted about invisible and visible disabilities This branched over so many different topics, but the overarching theme really was talking about the social model of disability. If you don't know what that is, I would really encourage you to research that. Whether you're a professional or a young person, it's actually something really, really important to understand. This actually impacts a lot of the ways in which you heard in this episode that how different disabled people are treated vastly different to able-bodied people. 
which just isn't fair. They spoke about ableism in schools, inaccessibility, and the differences of reaction to disability in different cultures. This podcast production was supported by Healthwatch Oxfordshire. If you want to find out more, make sure you go and check them out on social media, whether that's Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And if you want to raise your voice about different healthcare and social care things happening in Oxfordshire, make sure you head to Healthwatch's website, which is healthwatchoxfordshire.co.uk forward slash services to share anything that you would like to. For all the professionals listening to this episode, we want to thank you for taking the time out to listen to what young people have to say. We would love to hear from you and find out what ideas from this episode that you'll be taking away to put into your practice. And just like always, no matter what it is, you can get in contact with us via social media or you can also get in contact via our website through our contact form.